Facebook, on Twitch, on YouTube. If you could just give us some thumbs up in the chats, let us know that we are coming through loud and clear. That would be fantastic. Um, but here we are. We um, have real quick, Pat. I don't think we're quite live on Ambari's YouTube channel yet. We're not live on Ambari's YouTube channel. But we're live everywhere else. Hi, everyone. We're live everywhere else. Are we live now? <laughs> there we go. Yeah, we are. This is this is the wonders <laughs> of live streams is you never really quite know where you're live at any given time. Feels kind of like a plankton on the current. You know, you don't quite know where the stream is headed. Um, you just kind of got to go with the flow. But I think we're live right now. And if we are, that means that we are going to start that introduction up one more time. How's about that? Hello, everybody. Welcome to this live stream here for Into the Deep. My name's Patrick. I work for the Monterey Bay Aquarium social media team. And uh, joining us today, we've got some, some very incredible guests. Uh, we're so happy to be here with you on Ambari's YouTube and Facebook, on the Aquarium's Twitch, YouTube and Facebook as well. And uh, joining us as always here for these live streams, we have right here below me in our little portholes, we've got Emily. Emily is gonna be monitoring the chat, pulling up your questions. Emily, how you doing way down there on the, uh, uh, on the screen? How you doing? Oh, I, I'm shrimply the best today, Patrick, because we've got George and Mackenzie joining us. I'm, I'm excited for this conversation that we're gonna have today. Absolutely. Yes. Joining us over on this other side of the screen in their portholes there down in our animated deep sea, uh, we have Mackenzie from the aquarium, a uh, jellyfish biologist extraordinaire. We won't go through all of these superlatives because we'll, we'll be here the entire time. So Mackenzie's over there on the side and then beneath her on the portholes, we have George Matsumoto from Embari as well, a jellyfish biologist and too many superlatives as well. We have a dream team here, Emily, joining us right now. Uh, Mackenzie, how you doing over there? Can you tell us where you are in the world right now? Because you've got the better backdrop. Oh, it's all relative, Patrick, but I'm doing great. I'm so excited to be having this conversation with you all as well. I'm sitting in front, well, on top of, I should say, our open sea exhibit here at the Monterey Bay Aquarium. I'm actually, even though it looks like I'm not above water, I technically am. This is a big square tank with a circular insert. So I'm sitting over a corner of the 1.2 million gallons that is this offshore exhibit. That's wonderful. Yeah, that open sea exhibit that you folks will get to see in a different way during our Into the Deep exhibition. Again, opening April 9th, 2022. You'll get to see that lower window that's been closed off for many years now, incorporated in a very special way there into the deep. And actually, George and I were just there last night doing a very special uh, live event for aquarium members and donors. It's good to see you again uh, there, George. Now we're here digitally, but uh, great to spend some time with you last night talking about this new exhibit good to see you patrick it's it's uh, i think a lot more fun in person because now i'm at uh, ambari so i'm, I'm probably <laughs> about 20 miles away from you today gotcha yeah and so we are here to talk about something very very special and for those of you who are subscribed to our youtube channel and to our facebook and if you're not smash that like button make sure that you're subscribed to all of our social media feeds uh you got to see george and mckenzie already teaming up in a blackwater diving video amazing video footage such an incredible story so please make sure to take a look at that video once we are wrapped up here um but george mckenzie we're here to talk about this very incredible experience that you got to have out there diving over what to a diver is infinite water deep below you thousands of feet of ocean and you got to witness the Earth's largest animal migration uh that happens every night in the ocean and right now i'm going to throw to this video here we've got Mackenzie and George there underwater in Hawaii shining their lights oh it seems like seems like our video just paused right there let me see if I can play that one more time pause. yeah there it goes right there um George Mackenzie can you tell us a little bit about what it is that we're seeing right here uh with 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 the diving whoever feels like going first can you describe what a black water dive is Whoever feels like going. Go ahead, Mackenzie. Okay, well, I am I feel like George feels very similar to me, that it's just one of the coolest experiences you can have as a human being, as a diver. Uh, you know, we both have so much experience underwater, but most of that experience is, you know, 
right at the surface, but towards shore. And so that's the biggest mind bend for me was cruising three to five miles away from the island of Hawaii and jumping in above this 5,000 foot of water. Like it's, it's just, uh, it's hard to picture it, your tiny little body dangling at the surface, but it just, it's the most present I think I've ever been underwater. That one hour, you know, we, we do it over multiple nights because we, you know, have jobs, to do, but uh, you, you can't not think about what you're doing. You're seeing incredible animals all around you. They're glittering with bioluminescence. Um, you can't see them until you point your lights at them and they're right there. Um, it just, it expands your curiosity. Like what's behind me? What's, what is all this? It's a completely foreign environment that takes up like 98% of the ocean you can start. It's an honor to be a part of it. Wow, I love that's a great answer, Mackenzie. And, yeah. and it's, <laughs> I no, feel so deeply about it. <laughs> <laughs> For anybody who's been in the ocean, whether they've been snorkeling or just looking around in tide pools or even scuba diving, blackwater diving is so different because you don't see anything. There's there's nothing there until you shine your light on something. And and so it's just a very strange feeling. Um, and as Mackenzie said, you really do feel more as one with the ocean, I think, than other other times we've been in the water. That's fascinating. We have the video on a loop there in the background. And I and I love we didn't prepare this ahead of time, but both times that you said you don't see anything until you shine a light on it. That was when you were <laughs> shining a light on what's known as a doliolid. And uh, if I can pull that up here uh, for myself, I think I have it right here. Yes. So this is that animal that was first revealed in the in the video when you were shining your light. Um, can either of you describe a little bit about what this kind of animal is? Because there's a lot of folks out there watching. I'm sure, Emily, you're looking at the comments that already, just in that short clip, what was revealed doesn't look like too many animals in the ocean that you're used to seeing. We saw the doliolid. We saw the Venus's girdle comb jelly that was there. Really ethereal animals that are really hard to describe, not something we see on land. Oleolids are great animals. Uh, for one, they're relatively closely related to us. So they are what we call urochordates or almost chordates. So they almost have similar structures to humans, the dorsal hollow nerve cord, gill slits uh, when they're very young. Um, and so when we look at animals like this, it's just kind of staggering to think about the ocean as sort of the birthplace of life. And we see these beautiful animals swimming through the water, and we know so little about them. And doliolids, you know, are just these filter feeding animals that cruise through the water column, uh, filtering out the water, eating the things that they like to eat, like the phytoplankton, the plant-like plankton, um, and essentially cleaning the water in the surface areas, but at the same time, depositing other things that feed animals in the deeper waters. Oh, that's wonderful. Mackenzie, how do you feel about the doliolids or uh, the other ethereal animals you have there? I'll, I'll put up the, the Venus's girdle here in just a second, but uh, tell us a little bit about that discovery there. Yeah, I, I think that was so well put, George. I, uh, to me, part of Blackwater, the experience of seeing all the midwater versions of animals, like, uh, you know, the doliolids, the tunicate, but there's benthic versions of them, things that are on the bottom, you know, like a big predatory tunicate with the mouth or a tunicate that's in tide pools, you know, with just two little um, siphon cords. But then you see a doliolid with this fantastic barrel shaped body, and this elegant tail. It's, it's um, yeah, it's wild. It's a completely foreign shape for your mind to process. But uh, and I had I feel I, the same way about uh, Sesto, the Venus. I had, yeah, I had the the uh, Venus's girdle up, put the doliolid back up. So I'm putting this comb jelly back up because this is an impressive comb jelly. And uh, you know your way around comb jellies, uh, Mackenzie. But what can you tell us about uh, Sestum? Because goodness, what an animal. And we can see right now one of the photographers that was helping you all out there. I believe that's uh, our friend Jeff uh, from Hawaii, looking at over a foot long comb jelly. Can you describe a little bit more uh, of this animal? What's going on with it? It looks so unlike other comb jellies. It looks so unlike other comb jellies, Patrick, totally right. I mean, it's like a big prismatic rainbow ribbon kind of bit. It swirls in the water and it twists and turns and then it also stretches out and just looks like an airplane thing to me. It's 
So I see it and yeah, what a what a challenge to collect, huh, George? So yeah, I feel like I've seen uh, I've seen some really cool techniques to swirl those into our bags and take them back. But uh, yeah, because they could get up to a meter long, so three feet yeah. uh, sometimes. So a little long for a jar. Just so long. you do have a to sort of jar. you have to tickle them a little bit to get them to roll up. <laughs> and, <laughs> wait, and wait, wait. Still, <laughs> are we are you telling us that a scientific technique is tickling a comb jelly potentially to bring it into that's that's one well we don't know whether or not tina force actually have that uh tickling sensation okay but they certainly right. react right. when you touch them a little bit and they'll they'll coil up like that and we go then put them into a jar they still have all the cilia that regular comb jellies have and tentacles uh they're just in different places and so it's it's really kind of cool Oh, uh, that's, that's wonderful. Okay. So we jumped right into it. We already saw some of those animals there that that you're describing in uh, Mackenzie, that the way that you described the dive of being the most present that you've been uh, in the ocean, that's actually some, I, I've been uh, very fortunate to do this exact same dive. Uh, and it feels the most out of this world that you could ever feel because the visibility, there are some questions out there, you know, black water, is it dark and, and so mysterious? It's, it's incredibly black water because you're at night, but the water is clear with all of these things streaming by you and every little animal or every little speck that's streaming by you, just like a star in hyperspace. If you can let your eyes adjust and see, you realize that's an animal. Wait, that's an animal. That's a larva. So if you kind of know the general layout of what ocean animals are out there, it's it's the most mind blowing thing you've ever seen. It's like experiencing that whole other world, the galaxy, as it were, or as they tend to call it, pelagic magic for the folks out there that are diving. Now well, I've seen that's, yeah, that's a great term, and and you know when you describe the night sky it, when i think about blackwater diving it's sort of similar because it's dark just as it is above the ocean uh, and you could see stars off in the distance and that's what it's kind of like when you're blackwater diving it's very dark it's very similar to what you see in the darkness above uh, the ocean um, and every so often you'll see these little specks and when you zoom in to take a look at these little specks instead of a star or a planet we're finding these beautiful animals um, and the best time to do blackwater diving, of course, is when there's no moon, because these animals are moving upwards at night, and they're doing that to feed in water where hopefully all the predators that are up there can't find them. And if there's moonlight, now the predators can find them. So much better to go when it's really dark at the surface and really dark underwater. Right, because if there was that moonlight, it, the predators would make satellite work of consuming the rest of the animals that are there, right? We've got a pun counter going over on Twitch, just in case anyone was wondering why we're <laughs> oh, trying no, to... Oh, no, I didn't reset the pun oh, counter. Oh, we're all good. Okay, so... <laughs> I can get my <laughs> So we've been, we've been, we jumped right in there, and I've been seeing Emily here furiously typing away, answering questions, compiling all... This is the kind of ocean experience that I think a lot of people dream about. And so uh, I'm sure there are a lot of questions. Emily, uh, I know that we've missed a ton already, but generally speaking, is there a larger theme of what people are wanting to find out kind of right off the bat here about blackwater diving? Uh, a lot of questions just kind of about blackwater diving itself, which is great. I do have to say, again, our audience is completely blowing me away uh they've already beaten uh last stream's record i i am up to a page and a half of questions oh, that have wow. come in uh last time we only got to a full page so uh only got to a full right, page only. so we're gonna do our best to get through a lot of these questions the good news is that some of them you have already answered so thanks george and mac for being psychic like that and reading my mind <laughs> Um, let's grab a couple of these just kind of basic questions about this black water dive that you are on right now. Uh, folks are curious about how many feet deep you all were in, uh, in the water there. And, um, is that darkness that you're in disorienting when you're down there? Both of those are great questions. And the maximum depth that we'll go to is probably around 80 or 90 feet most of the things we'll collect will be even shallower than that. So we'll probably spend more time between 30 and 60 feet. Uh, it's, it, it just means the shallower the, the dive, the longer we could spend in the water. So if you go all the way down to 90 feet, 
it's a relatively short dive because we're diving what we call no decompression. In other words, we don't want to have to dive so deep that we have to stop on the way up. Uh, so the shallower we go, the longer we could stay in and the more animals we collect. And in terms of disorientation, absolutely. And that's one of the reasons why you could see all the lines in the water with us. Uh, because especially in the darkness, if you're following an animal um, and it starts to go down and you start following it, you may <laughs> not realize that you've dropped 20 or 30 feet unless you've got a line attached to you that starts that you start yanking because now you've gone too deep and your safety diver 30 feet up above you is saying, you can't go any deeper. Mm. Um, and that's why we use these lines because otherwise some of the things we see you know, you see a squid and you start going down and you start following it and, and you know, it's tempting to go deep. Right. Yeah. Mackenzie, did you have that same call of the of the depths when you were on, on this dive? Was that challenging for you? Yeah, well said, Jordan. Um, you know, it's, it's challenging because, yes, you're hyper-focused on what you were saying, Patrick, like small, tiny constellations going by, little tiny animals. So you, A, there's not really great points of reference. There's no bottom to look at. So you don't, you can't really be like, okay, 10 seconds ago I was here. Um, you have to kind of rely on your lungs, your pregnancy control and your buddies. But your buddies are also going everywhere. Or just sometimes right above me and then, oh, how'd you get down there so fast? It was me moving, you know? And so it is pretty disorienting. And I found my very first blackwater dive I did, I spent a lot of time staring below me, just thinking, there's 5,000 feet of water below me, and that was, uh, yeah, it was difficult to process. But uh, once you get kind of laser focused on the small animals all around you, I find it to be almost like a normal dive where you're looking at tiny little things on the reef. You let your mind relax. Gotcha. Amazing. Awesome. Um, George, you, you touched a little bit on this um, when you were talking about the lines and your buddies really making sure you know, like, don't go deeper. What are some other considerations, safety or otherwise, that we have to take into account when we go on blackwater dives? Uh, well, some of the other things you need to make sure you take into account, and the thing that I, you, probably the most often asked question I get is, what about large animals that might come in out of the darkness? Um, does that bother you? And and the answer is, is uh, I don't really think too much about that because if you start thinking about that, you're going to spend your whole time frantically waving your flashlight around looking for these things that may never show up. And so, uh, you know, sure, the aquarium's got large things in the water. Uh, and with all the dives we've made, you know, Mac and I have been in the water, I don't know how many times, uh, we have yet to see a large pelagic predator. The, probably the most dangerous thing we've seen is a box jelly. Wow. And, and they're impressive and we stay well away from them because they sting and they hurt. They're big. I was surprised how big those box jellies were, George. I was thinking it'd be small. Oh. No way. The body was like this big. The tentacles were 10 feet long. Or <laughs> oh yeah, no, I got to, I got to see a, a, a box jelly that was similar on the surface and swimming very quickly towards the boat. Um, yeah. and I think the box refers to boxing and wanting to punch you in the face. It seemed very aggressive. Uh, yeah. no, on the blackwater dive, I was fortunate enough to do, we had, um, towards the end of the dive, we had a swordfish come up about three, four feet long, stayed on the edges because these lights are attracting a lot of their prey. And so the swordfish came up like, are you, are you? done with that squid because i'm kind of thinking are you good um and then right at the end there was an oceanic white tip shark that came up uh to take a look but um very different from uh what people's expectations were our dive guide actually swam towards this animal to try to see about retrieving the fishing hook that it had in it so it was much more of a um you know trying to help out the the large shark that showed up than everybody needing to get out of the water right away it's a really an amazing experience out there yes Emily, do you have anything else for the? Folks? Yeah, I'm going to ask you all, all three of you, this question um, that came in, which has come in in quite a few places after all these descriptions that you've given of being down there. Some of them kind of like, you know, you're in outer space, you're floating there. Were any of you scared on your very first blackwater dive? 
I'll, I'll answer that first. And, and uh, I think I was fortunate in that I've spent years doing what we call blue water diving, which is the same thing as black water, only you do it during the daytime. And so you could see all around you, um, up, down, all around. So by the time I did my first black water dive in the darkness, I was already very comfortable with the whole apparatus and the setup and, and um, how everything works. And so uh, the black water dive for me was just fun and exciting, but I'll let Mackenzie and Patrick answer. Uh, I actually, so I don't have as much blue water experience as George, but I was fortunate enough to do two uh, in preparation for these black water dives. And I almost felt like they were more scary for me. Like they were out in Monterey Bay. The visibility was not very great as it can be sometimes. And so it was just pretty spooky. It almost was like a black water dive that I wasn't mentally prepared for. So I was like, it's sunny outside, but uh, there was so much plankton in the water. Um, but there was the moment before I jumped off where I thought, what am I doing right now? But then I just did it and it was awesome. And it was so exciting. And I just, I couldn't stop talking about it for weeks. Oh yeah. No, it's, um, uh, it's definitely intimidating because it's not the general style of diving that you do. But if you watch that blackwater diving video again, you'll see that we had uh, our dive safety officer, uh, George Peterson there. Um, we're very well trained. We're very fortunate in the, in the Monterey Bay area to have folks that are really making sure that we've got our safety and our protocols. And so once you realize that there are a lot of systems in place that are there to help with everything from those lines to help you know that you're going too deep um, to having a free swimming dive that's looking to make sure that you're doing okay, uh, you can really start to zone in on just experiencing the water. And that's when your breathing slows down, your ears kind of tell you where you are in the water column. And then suddenly you start seeing some of these animals and, and you're like, oh, okay, yeah, this is really awesome. But there's always that little bit of trepidation. Anytime you go somewhere new, a new dive site, a new dive style, and you're always going to be a little bit a little bit more uh, hesitant and focused, which helps you stay in that moment, like you were describing, Mackenzie. I, I often get asked, how do you get trained to go blue water diving? And there really is no training setup per se. If you're a scientific research diver, you there are you can get trained in blue water and black water diving. Um, but if you're a recreational diver, uh, there are diving, there are dive boats where you could go out and charter and you could go out black water diving. Um, the only thing I would recommend is that you are very comfortable in the water. You're able to control your buoyancy, as Patrick said, so that you're not just going up and down in the water, you know, with every every time you take a breath. Uh, the more control and the more experience you have in the water, I think the more you're going to enjoy it. So uh, take your time and, and do, do multiple dives in shallower waters and near shore. And, and when you feel comfortable, look into some of these other dive companies. Yeah. Yeah, Emily, let's but, let, let's go to you and those questions. And then uh, at some point here, let, we'll segue back into showing some really cool animals that you uh, got <laughs> to see, Mackenzie and George. Uh, we've got some of those, some video clips. But yes, Emily, what, what do yeah, the folks out there want to know? I mean, know? you continue knocking it out of the park on this whole <laughs> psychic uh, level that we're on here, uh, answering some of these questions. I've knocked quite a few off of the list here. Um but this one, I actually uh, thought was kind of neat. Uh, again, a little bit more uh, of a technical question here, but um, it has to deal with how far offshore did you have to go to do this dive? Because, you know, here in Monterey, we always talk about how lucky we are that we have the deep sea. We have this big, beautiful canyon right off of our, our shores. But, you know, if we tried to do this over on the East Coast, it would be a little bit different. If you tried to do it anywhere else on the California coast, it might be a little bit different. What was it like out there in Hawaii? How far out did you have to go? So the basic idea is you want to get out and you want to be in three to 5,000 feet of water. And so you just keep going out away from shore, away from the island until you get into deep water. Once you find that area of deep water, you don't just hop over the side. The other thing we're looking for are surface slicks, areas on the surface of the water that look much calmer than the surrounding area, because that's an indication that there's animals there. There's, there's some sort of food or there's something happening there. Um, and that's, that's a re really good way to maximize what you're going to go see. The other nice thing about surface slicks, if you don't see any surface slicks, 
and the water's white capping, that's not a good day to go, <laughs> a good night to go blackwater diving uh, because <laughs> you really rely on the boat not dragging you through the water. And if it's windy or choppy or bad weather, when you jump over the side and you've got a line from the boat to the divers, if the boat is moving, the divers are moving. And if the divers are being pulled by the boat, we can't collect anything. Right. So you need calm, you need calm water um, and you need surface slicks and deep water. That's right. We learned that the hard way, I think, George. <laughs> speaking trip. from like, experience yeah we're like it's the first day let's do it it doesn't matter that the boat's doing this and yeah we all were just hanging on the line being dragged by the boat didn't collect much maybe oh, no. somebody did out of pure luck just, yeah Always some trial and error. And with this particular style of diving, it, it's it's not new to people who are diving, but it's fairly new to have the cameras and uh, Facebook groups and all these other places where it's starting to come out. So it's becoming more popular, but these systems are getting refined all the time. It's not most people that are just like, yeah, let's go off on the edge where we're literally in the middle of the ocean, next stop, one side or the other. You're either in Japan or you're back in California uh, when, you're, when you're out there. So... Um, Wonderful. Okay. Emily, are there any yep. other questions there? Otherwise, I kind of oh, want to. Oh, start we're up to two pages of questions, two? but I, okay. I think that we can jump into to questions that are going to help key up some of the, the videos of the and everything animals, that, yeah. that you've, you've got there, Patrick, because uh, let, let's go ahead and dive in. Why were we even in Hawaii? Why choose Hawaii? What were we doing out there? Let's talk a little bit about maybe what's what's going on with uh into the deep and why we were blackwater diving mac do you want to do you want to tackle yeah, that one i would love to yeah so you know we're developing well we're about to open a deep sea exhibit here at the modern day aquarium and part of that are not just creatures that their day right down in the depths but these this unique opportunity to study these creatures that travel all the way to the surface at nighttime and then all the way back down to the depths when it's sunny outside. That's the largest migration on the planet that happens every 24 hours. It's a, a diurnal vertical migration that I think George knows a ton about. But uh, that's the unique experience that we, you know, joined every night and met those deep sea creatures at a place where we could be around them, which is the surface waters. And right now, uh, playing behind you, uh, Mackenzie, I have um, a little medley going on uh, that I'm going to start playing of some siphonophores. I just wanted to bring that up as maybe a first animal to talk about because siphonophores are an organism that have uh, never really been displayed in a public aquarium. And uh, these particular species behind us right now, we've got the Christmas tree siphonophore for Scalia. Maybe not something that will be on display, not something that's local here, but can you describe a little bit about what a siphonophore is and its role in the midwater? Because we, we tease that this is the largest animal migration that happens uh, every night in the ocean. And this is one of those animals that is migrating along with a lot of these other organisms. So maybe if we just want to talk a little bit about the role of a siphonophore, and then George may will throw it over to you as to what this animal migration that the siphonophore is a part of. So Mackenzie, what, what can you tell us about this beautiful stinging Christmas tree siphonophore here? It's so beautiful. It just looks like somebody blew a beautiful glass of water and it's swimming into the water. Um, yeah, basically it's a siphonophore for Scalia, the Christmas tree siphonophore. Yes, we do actually have a local species of siphonophore that look pretty similar, but um, this image you're seeing is the Hawaiian one. And it, yeah, it's it's so beautiful. It's, um, it's a colonial organism, which is still mind blowing to me. It's a bunch of animals working together in harmony so that they all can live or die. Ultimately, they, they're in it together. And mm. so there's, you know, the, I would say the Christmas tree parts are the swimming, the swimming parts. They're called nectophores. And then the ornament, the beautiful drapey bits are the tentacles that are attached to the stomachs. So the ones that you know, bring up the bacon, if you will. <laughs> but, uh, and then, yeah, there's the reproductive parts as well. And uh, 
Yeah, they all start from just one, they're called zoids, and then they asexually bud off until they're this beautiful, long organism that you know, works for a common goal to live. That's wonderful. And now behind you, we have a mystery siphonophore. Mm -hmm. um, a calicophorin there is playing in the background. Yeah, such a mystery. I mean, I think currently there's 175 species of siphonophores described. So is this the 176? Yeah. Uh, or maybe it is something somebody knows that's a specialist with siphonophores. But yeah. Again, so many different body shapes, all, all specialized parts of their body that do specific things. And it's also so organized there. There's a lot to learn from them, I believe. That's awesome. Now, uh, back up to, to us here, topside, George. Um, this, that siphonophore, and thank you, Mackenzie, for that, for that description. The, that's an animal that most people, uh, we don't experience on land, but is a feature in the deep sea. Siphonophores are one of the most common predators that you have out there in that midwater. And that is something to consider if you are one of these trillions of organisms that are migrating up and down every night in the ocean. Can you describe a little bit about what it is that you're seeing on a black water dive that you don't typically get to see in shallower water or during a regular night dive? Well, absolutely. And Mackenzie gave a great explanation of what a siphonophore is and what these jellies do is, you know, they have these long bodies sometimes that have thousands, well, hundreds of stomachs and lots of tentacles. And it's, it's, it's essentially a giant, fishing net trying to catch all the animals that are swimming by. And these animals that are swimming by are part of this migration that Mackenzie and both and, and Patrick talked about, this vertical migration where animals are moving up from the deep sea up into the surface waters to feed at nighttime. And they're doing that at night so that they don't get eaten by the visual predators. Uh, it's hard to avoid these non-visual predators though, like these siphonophores, especially when the siphonophores also migrate. So not only do they have to swim by, through and by these siphonophores, but the siphonophores swim up to the surface with them. Um, so it's, it's really a tough gauntlet that these migrators have to get through every single night just to get a meal and then swim back down so they don't become a meal. And just and now, George, I just want to let you know, I transitioned from a siphonophore just to one of the better swimming uh, videos that we have of one of the other organisms there. We've got a sea elephant currently there behind you. So we had Forscalia again, and then we've got this incredible swimming animal here of a sea elephant. Um, so, so many different types of animals that are going. A sea elephant is a mollusk. Um, yeah, not a true elephant. Right. It's actually a snail. It's just <laughs> called an elephant because it has what looks like a long nose, like an elephant nose. Proboscis. Yeah. <laughs> And so these, these animals are going up and down here. I'll play, uh, uh, I've got a sea butterfly here right now. What can you tell us about these different types of animals that are coming up and down in that, in that drama? And I'll play a little medley and I'll interrupt well, these, which kind these of- These animals have. are really stunning because they're tiny. And so when you think about them swimming hundreds of meters, right? Thousands of feet up and down, it's, it's sort of the equivalent of maybe a human being swimming a 10K or a half marathon just to go up to the surface to get a meal and then turning around after they finish eating and swimming another half marathon to get back down to safety. And these animals do it every night for their meal. Um, and it's, it's just staggering. And this particular sea angel, this sea butterfly has an added complication in that it's heavy, it sinks. And so when it swims up to the surface, it really has to work hard. Swimming down, not so hard, right? Because now I'm, now I'm full, I've got a full stomach and my shell is heavy, so I'm just gonna fall. <laughs> Much easier to get down than get up. And the only problem it has is it doesn't wanna go too deep, right? Because if it goes too deep, it can't swim up to the surface again the next day. Right. And I don't have any idea how it knows how far is too deep. Oh, that's fascinating. Now, I had up on screen for just a short second a gossamer worm, also known as Tomopterus. I've seen these actually uh, on the surface here in Monterey Bay. Every so often, some of these deeper water animals, I think, come up to the surface and then the wind kind of blows them into where scuba divers uh, get to see them. But those gossamer worms, the Tomopterus worms that you folks have heard about, um, 
Mackenzie, I know that you have, uh, or, or both you, uh, Mackenzie and George, you have an affinity for this type of organism, which is the spotted comb jelly here, Leukothea is currently up on screen. Some of those comb jellies, uh, Leukothea pulchra, we have on exhibit right now. So you're, you're telling us, George, that these animals are moving up and down in the water column, trying to feed on each other or on what was made near the surface, then trying to escape from the surface before the light comes up. Is that correct? That's right, that's right. And, and that gossamer worm that you showed to me is really stunning because we've seen these gossamer worms using the remotely operated vehicles that Ambari has. Uh, they could go down to 4,000 meters, you know, two and a half miles down. And we've seen them in the deep waters laying eggs wow. and making an egg case. And I have a feeling that's exactly what this tomopterid is doing up in the shallow waters. It's spinning an egg case. Whoa. And it has the circular you know, spherical egg case, you know, that it's sort of, dry. we we must have disturbed it a little bit. And so she's, you know, she's swimming away trying to find a nice quiet spot to start again. Um, but they lay this beautiful spherical, this round egg case, and then they let it drift in the deep sea. And eventually all the little eggs that are in that hatch and all these little tiny baby gossamer worms swim out. Oh, wow. I see that now that the worm is swimming around that particular case, maybe making, oh, wow, that's super yeah. cool. And that's just, and that's just one little thing happening in the that's water column as, thing. as you're diving by, just like a little mom, a proud mama Tomoptis worm setting up and then being like, oh no, wait, I, I don't want to sign all these releases for all these little baby worms to be in the aquarium videos. We got to get on the video lights on, yeah. you know, this is, this is too much. I got to go somewhere else. Wow. Emily, that was yeah. quite a little bit there. What what are the folks wanting to know more of? We've got we've got quite a few more animal videos, but uh, now that we know what that Tomoptis worm might might be up to, I mean, let's just watch this on loop till the end of the stream. But no, maybe yeah, the, people want to. This stuff. is now a worm stream, right? Worm stream, um, <laughs> worm stream only. No, actually, you kind of touched on uh, the question I was going to bring up. Uh, we we have this question uh, again from a couple of different people in the chat here. Uh, we've been throwing up a lot of different video clips of these animals. It's kind of hard for us to get a sense of the scale of the animals that we're looking at. So, uh, Mackenzie, can you talk a little bit about are these big animals that we're seeing down there, little animals? What's what's what are we looking at? Yeah, Emily, I would love to. Um, the majority of the animals you're looking at are actually quite small. I mean, I would say two inches is a pretty average size of these very ornate, crazy looking animals. Um, the biggest one, I think we were talking about already was that really large comb jelly, the Venus girdle, and that was almost out of place. It was so large. We also saw a few irisomes, which were, um, big filter feeding tunes as well, floating through that were on the bigger side. But uh, yeah, other than that, everything's really, really tiny. I mean, one time I was just floating there looking around for um, you know, what we were looking for, and this little tiny bobtail squid came up to me, and I think he was trying to use me as protection, like to hide. <laughs> and so it just tucked right in the middle of the crook of my arm. I'm like, this is such a tiny little, you know, squid, but really in in relation, it's an average sized animal, but just such a little guy. Just sat there and eventually, you know, had to go. But that was, it's unique, you know, there's nowhere to hide at the deep sea amongst other tiny animals. Perhaps you can get lost in the mosaic of life. But um, other than that, yeah. I love I love that idea of your elbow being a safe harbor in the storm for a tiny little bobtail squid that's that that's up yeah. there in the water column. I was like, I can't move. This is it. It's like when a cat sits on you. Nope, that's it. I, moving. <laughs> I currently have that pyrosome that you're mentioning. A couple different uh, looking pyrosomes there uh, up on screen, but you mentioned the squid, and I want to uh, play um, the sharpier anope squid because these are absolutely out of this world. Some of the best black water photographs that I've ever seen involve uh, these little squid. Uh, does anyone feel like discussing what it's like to come up with this squid? And then the next one we'll play is the purple back flying squid. But does anybody have a little anecdote about uh, this incredible squid friend here? Anyone? <laughs> these are these are great animals. And, and these two and the blanket octopus are animals that could make or break a dive for say a photographer. Um, and it's um, always amazing to see these types of animals. They're animals that we normally don't try to collect um, when we're out blackwater diving. 
you could see that one of the things that happens when we're shining our lights is a lot of other animals are attracted to the lights. And so this poor squid now is being swarmed by amphipods, by these little tiny crustaceans that are attracted uh, by the lights. And maybe the squid's designed to feed on some of them. At least I hope so, because the little amphipods like to eat jellies usually. Right. And then, okay, so we've got that little squid there. Now, George, I've got the purple back flying squid there next to you. What was it like to see these on the dive? These are just stunning. And these, you know, I, I referred to these earlier because when they when they jet through, I mean, they're fast, they're good sized, unlike everything else that we see, which is pretty small. And, and so when we see that big giant large squid come through, you know, it's, it's about 12 to 16 inches, um, half a meter maybe. Uh, when it goes through, you're tempted to kind of follow it just to see what it's doing because it's such a beautiful animal. Uh, but they swim so fast, you can't go very far. Mackenzie, but, what do you think about the squid? I was just going to say, they're, uh, I never realized how how much volume of ink can come out of a squid. <laughs> squid. Like, I, I could be looking at George like, yeah, we're having the best dive ever. And a squid's just, no, you can't see each other anymore. And just wow. whoosh, ink the whole way. And, uh, you just have to wait. Wow. That's a, that's a good technique for, you know, having your own disguise. I thought maybe maybe you'd scared the squid like in Nemo and oh you made me ink. Um, I mean probably yeah we're pretty scary under there probably with all our lights you know I have a light strapped to me here and a light here and yeah it's got to be kind of erratic for something that's used to just being in the dark and yeah the deep fish that comes by so. It is difficult to escape the fact that the idea of uh, aliens coming down with bright lights and shining them on you is pretty much what it's like to night dive in the ocean. It's really hard yeah. to escape that tractor beam analogy in your mind. And for anybody out there who's wondering, flying squid, yes, these are squid that are just like a flying fish. They jump out of the water. They can spread out their um, their mantle fins and glide for a little bit to escape predators like uh, a swordfish or a mahi-mahi that might be going after them. In case you're wondering where the term flying squid came from. Uh, mm -hmm. Emily, that's yes. quite a few quite a few animals there. I hope, I, I no. mean, I know you're furiously answering a whole bunch of questions over there. So the audience is being well taken care of. Don't you worry. And George, we know, is just going to go into every single comment and question after the fact and, and answer them <laughs> uh, in real time. But Emily, uh, what do the folks want to know out there? Um, actually, this is a, a great transition because you mentioned collecting. So we have a lot of questions uh, about what the process of collecting during these black water water dives is like are there pros and cons versus taking our say like our rovs down to collect an animal uh, what is what is the benefit of being there in front of these animals and trying to collect them i would say yeah it's a uh, in place of an rov you're the rov and so there's you can just make the decision and use um you know, we have kind of delicate techniques that we've been curating through working with jellies at the aquarium here. And it's kind of hard to be, have that amount of finesse when you're, you know, piloting a large robot from the surface of the ocean. So to me, it was extremely beneficial. And you're making an in-situ uh, observation at the same time. So saying, oh, look at this reaction, you know, me delicately putting it inside a jar versus, um, Okay, we got it on video. Hopefully, we can rewatch that. But uh, it's something very, uh, yeah, I don't know, first person about it that's invaluable to me. Uh, but it, it does present challenges. We were talking about our already, it's a bit disorienting, and you know, there's lights flashing everywhere, and you're attached to the boat and your buddies. So there's some, you have to have some major body awareness. But then you take the whole, um, you know, take a jar out of a, a bag. Make sure you close the back, slowly collect the animal while maintaining neutral buoyancy. Don't put it in your other bag. Don't drop anything. It'll go 5,000 feet, you know? So it's extremely challenging, but with um, high reward. How do you feel about that, George? I think that's absolutely right. And, and you know, some people ask, what do we collect and how often do we collect? And do you collect everything you see? And the answer is no. We're very, very careful about what is collected. And, and we have collection permits with the state of Hawaii. Uh, and so um, what we're looking for are very specific creatures uh, that 
we think might make nice exhibit animals for somewhere, somehow. Um, and so it's it's very deliberate collections. And and just like we with remotely operated vehicles, the ROVs that Ambari has, we don't tend to collect very rare or very delicate animals that we don't see very often. We're collecting things that are relatively common, um, but perhaps rare to aquarium display. Right. And speaking yeah. of a aquarium display, uh, currently, oh, I'm not sure what, why my, oh, there we go, caught up to itself there. Uh, Mackenzie, <laughs> we've got here a mauve stinger that uh, is currently on, uh, um, uh, or currently one of those animals that we're working with at the at the aquarium. Uh, mauve or mauve, um, I, I said mauve, but uh, can you tell us a little bit about this organism here as an example of one of those animals that's collected and then worked with um, by by yourself, other biologists to uh, to show people um, the, these animals that otherwise are not rare to the sea, but rare to sea. Uh -huh, I see what you did there, Patrick. Thanks. Yeah, this <laughs> is a perfect example of what Dwarf was mentioning. Um, this is a specific animal that we know we can, we're very confident about how to keep it alive and actually to, we call it poultry, to grow more generations up in the aquarium. So. You know, currently we're on the third generation of the jellies that were recently collected in Hawaii. And it's the very fulfilling for us here because, you know, we were selecting animals to take back to the aquarium, but then we're propagating them in mass to fill displays so people can observe with their eyes these vertical migrators that travel a thousand feet a night. There's little teeny tiny guys, like just what George was saying, that it's incredible that they can go so far. Uh, one thing that's really unique to culturing the mob stinger, Pelagia, um, is they're a uh, hollow planktonic animal. So they do not have a polyp phase in their life cycle, just like some jellies do. Uh, they directly develop. So basically they'll release these beautiful orange eggs. And generally it's after lunch. It's probably a photo period thing, but we can just slurp these little eggs out of, you know, the tank that they're in and we put them through a, a system that we've created here to grow up into jellies just directly into the, in the water. It's been, um, it's been great. Awesome. They stink too. <laughs> Mob stinger is the real deal. Awesome. Great stuff. Um, I have more questions. I see Patrick is, is we're, deep in produ producer yeah, we're mode stuff here. right now. Um, so I got more questions for you. Don't you worry. Um, you know, you, you kind of touched on this uh, a, a little bit before, um, but, you know, as we're watching these incredible videos uh, that we were able to capture of all these animals. And, you know, when we take our ROVs down to the deep sea, we have those cameras on them. It's a little bit easier for us to keep track of what we're seeing, what's going on, behaviors, things like that. But on just a normal run of the mill black water dive, how do you keep track of your observations and what you're seeing down there? <laughs> well, it depends on the purpose of the dive. If it was a research dive, you would probably have a underwater slate so that you could take um, notes while you're down there and make those observations. Or maybe you'd wait till you finish the dive and get up to the surface and then write down in your laboratory notebook. For collection dives, it's more important to know exactly what we collected, where we collected it, and what's going to happen to the specimens. Um, and so the aquarium is very careful about all of those. and. Uh, everything gets tracked from the minute it goes into a jar to when it leaves the jar. Um, and uh, I would say the aquarium is now building up a database so that they have a fairly good idea of what might be in the water at different times of the year, because we've been going down there at different times of the year now. So that you know, next time we want to go and maybe find some more mauve stingers, you know, we know when they were really common. And that's probably the time we'd want to go again. Awesome. awesome. All right. Um, this is a, a pretty cool question. You know, we've been talking about these black water dice being surrounded in the darkness there. Um, 
have we seen bioluminescence happen during these black water dives? Mac, do you want to tackle that one? Oh, sure. Yeah, I'd say constantly. I mean, I, I have done the thing that you're not supposed to be probably turn off all your lights just to experience it. And it's like, a, you know, in the analogy of the night sky, it's like shooting stars. There's little fireworks that are going off with this secret language that all these animals are speaking to each other, you know, get away from me or yikes, I'm, I'm trying to eat here or whatever they're saying. And uh, yeah, the variation between blue and green is phenomenal. I mean, we've even seen um, yellow spew, I will say, like a Tina for a cone <laughs> jelly shoot out yellow ink. Like, oh my God, what's happening? You know? Um, yeah, so the answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And even, you know, sometimes it's so bright that even with lights on, as long as the light, you know, if you look in a different direction to your light, you could still see the bioluminescence because it is bright. Yeah. That's, yeah. and currently uh, up on screen, we have those pyrosomes and pyrosomes means fire body. So they are a brightly bioluminescent uh, organism. And uh, we, we've got some of that video footage of, uh, of pyrosomes um, ready for, for you folks to take a look at in some upcoming videos as well. Um, and if you go to our, um, our YouTube channel again, uh, you'll be able to see, or on Twitch on the VODs, uh, you'll be able to see some uh, really amazing uh, discussions about bioluminescence uh, from Steve Haddock uh, out there. So if you want to learn more about bioluminescence, we've done a few live streams there. You get to see some of that video footage and pyrosomes currently behind us, fire bodies, um, brightly uh, bioluminescent there. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, Pat, I was just going to say, I'm keeping an eye on the time here. Yes. I think it's time for we're our, getting we're getting close to the rapid fire. Oh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. The rapid fire the question. Gauntlet. So, so George, Mac, are you ready to go through the gauntlet of rapid fire questions I have collected? That's right. You thought that the migration that these animals are <laughs> undertaking was really the gauntlet to get through, but wait until these no. inquisitive minds that Emily has been keeping at bay we're, finally We're break the through. real threat here. Us with <laughs> Short answers. Here we go. Yep. All right. Short answers. We're going to try and get through these, as many of these as we can. All right. So. We'll start and we'll go, how about, uh, we'll go Mac first to answer, then George to answer. What is the cutest thing that you have seen on a Blackwater dive? Cutest thing? Cutest um, thing. Okay. Besides that little bobtail, I'd say I really like the larval lobsters. They're so cute and weird. They look like a little flat animal, big old pinchy claws swimming around. Pretty 100%. Pretty me. That's awesome. Cute. I don't have a larval lobster up on screen, Mac, but we do have a mantis shrimp. Close second. Yeah. There it goes. All right, George, what's your cutest animal that you've seen? Well, I don't think we have it on video, but I think the blanket octopus is pretty stunning. So no. That's a valid 100%. Yes. Also very cute. All right. Here comes the next one. Any cool shrimp that you've seen down there? George, you want to take that I, one? Yeah, uh, you know, I, we, we see suggested shrimp sometimes in the upper waters. And to me, that's just stunning because I'm so used to seeing them with the ROV in deep water. And to see them on a night dive right in front of me, you know, makes me want to try to reach out and grab them because they're hard to collect with an ROV. Oh, but I refrain because that's not one of our animals. <laughs> right. I've heard those called the ski shrimp before. So they've got those two long oh, antennas. Wow. Like they're skiing. They're really cool. Looking. And they're looking for metaphorical pizzas or French fries then. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Depending yeah. on their level. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. Um, all right. This one, a little bit more generalized, but I felt like you two were the perfect people to answer this question. What's your favorite deep sea invertebrate? Today. Non-committal. Today. Yeah. <laughs> Um, well, I'm partial to cone jellies myself, but recently these siphonophores are blowing my mind, guys. I think I'm, yeah, I'm going to go with siphonophores today. Jellies. Jellies. <laughs> yeah. All jellies? All, right. All, All jellies. Questions. All of them. 
That's okay. That's very hard. It's like trying to to pick your favorite child, you know? (laughs) Um, Okay. How about uh, what is the rarest animal that you've seen while diving? Um, It's a hard one because for me, I have such specific things I'm looking for. When I don't recognize something, it's rare to me. but I don't know, George, what do you think? Blackwater diving. Uh, boy, most most of what we see, we see a lot of. Uh, I did see uh, a larval pestle on my last dive. Uh, oh, that's that, a good that one. That was fantastic. The larval fish we see are just stunning to me. And part of that is because I know so little about them. And there's so many different shapes and sizes. And all I could do is look at them and say, I wonder who you're going to grow up to be. Because that, it's just crazy how many larval fish there are out there. Mm-hmm. And they don't look anything like what they're going to look like when they're adults. Yeah, here, I'll, I'll play some larval fish. Uh, oh, we've got a siphonophore currently playing, but uh, I'll play some <laughs> larval fish as we, uh, um, as we go to that next question. Here's a leptocephalus eel larva, also known as a glass eel, um, which is just a young moray or snake eel. Um, Emily, uh, next rapid fire question while we've got the- I, I was just gonna add, well, you have the leptocephalus larvae up, up there, a real fun fact. I actually got to see one of those um, in a tide pool of all places, believe Ooh. it or not, in Mexico one time. Wow. Yeah, I was uh, down there teaching and uh, my students and I found it. And I have to say that's that was my favorite tide pooling moment that I've ever had. <laughs> All right. Would you say your glass your, your glass eel was half full that day? Certainly. Yes, my glass eel was yeah. half full that day. <laughs> um, okay, back into the rapid fire questions here. Um, how about uh, have you ever? <laughs> this is I feel like very appropriate for Monterey. Have you ever been on a dive where there's so much plankton in the water when you get in that you can't see in front of you? <laughs> And how how do you deal with that? <laughs> Monterey Bay diving for people who have not been here before can sometimes be very thick, soupy diving where visibility is on the order of inches um, because we have such a productive ecosystem here. There's so much life here, which is why we, we love it here in Monterey Bay. But sometimes it could be a little frustrating. And the only thing you could do is try to go deeper to get into clearer water, or you just sort of say, it's going to be that kind of dive. It's going to be a kale smoothie kind of day. (laughs) Yeah, focus on a very interesting rock right in front of you, and you look at everything on that instead of trying to see it all. It's okay. Mm -hmm. (laughs) All right, this one, a little bit introspective, uh, but what animal that you've seen while blackwater diving has resonated with you the most? Hmm. You communed with any. I still have have to say with jellies because jellies always resonate with me. doesn't matter. Blackwater, blue water, deep water, shallow water. I like. Part of who you are. I'm currently very hungry, so I was thinking I might be like a Bukathia jelly, just like a big funnel, just eating everything in front of them in the moment. So. <laughs> All right. Well, again, just keeping an eye on the time here, we've been talking for an entire hour, believe it or not. <laughs> about uh, blackwater diving and all of these incredible critters uh, that, that we were so lucky to see out there. Um, but we always end with a couple of questions at the end of all of our streams here. And we actually had uh, these questions uh, sent in by a, a couple of people. So I'm gonna use their words uh, when, when, when uh, we throw this to you. Uh, Mac and George, and how about we'll go Mac first and then George. Um, what inspired you to get into this field of marine biology and deep sea biology? And do you have any advice for someone who wants to do the same? 
what a question. Um, well, for me personally, I, I love adventure and I love exploring the unknown. And so, um, you know, when you can jump into a completely different world, the ocean in this case, and find something fascinating and ask a bunch of questions, that's, and it was a natural path for me. Um, my personal pathway was through diving and now I'm into jelly biology, just like George in a different way. Um, so yeah, if, my advice would be try it out. Um, go scuba diving and see how you feel and see if that resonates with you. You have a, have a bunch of questions like what, what, are, what are all these things? And maybe you, you can explore the deep sea one day uh, to discover, no doubt, billions of other new species that haven't been described yet. Um, that's kind of one of my biggest passions and um, yeah every step I've taken has brought me here a lot of it was volunteering and just getting my hands wet and my feet wet if you will. Yeah. awesome nice Mackenzie um, I would agree with you I think I think what got me interested in it was putting a mask and snorkel on and actually looking under the surface of the ocean for the first time and it was just Amazing. I was down at Anacapa Island and what I saw under the water with the kelp and the abalones, there were a lot of abalones back then because I'm old, um, <laughs> it was just stunning. And, and to me, it's still, the ocean is still unexplored. I mean, not just the deep sea, even the shallow waters. We have new species that people are finding in wading and tide pools, right? There are new species everywhere. We know so little about what's in our oceans. Um, and most of these animals, you know, are new to science. It may be that the indigenous peoples in these areas already knew about some of these animals. So there's a whole wealth of knowledge that we haven't even tapped yet in our indigenous peoples. Uh, but we really have so much to learn from the ocean. And I encourage people to go out and just look, make observations, make notes of your observations, um, and keep track of things that you see and look for changes over time. And before you know it, you're a scientist. That was beautiful. <laughs> Slow claps all around, everybody. <laughs> if we could get um, some uh, some GGs in the chat, for those of you who know what that means over there on Twitch or over on, uh, on YouTube, some thank yous, some Ws in the chat for our esteemed guests and colleagues that were here joining us today. Mackenzie, George, thank you so much for spending some time with us and sharing uh, in your experience. Uh, and uh, Emily, thank you so much for fielding all of that, all of that connection, the questions that were coming in, pouring over. We've got pages uh, to, to go over. Just just to say, we, we got all the way into page three page of three. questions here. So thank you, everyone, for sending in those questions. We weren't able to get to all of them. I wish we could have, um, but if you still have questions, you can always shoot us a direct message. You can direct message Mbari as well, um, or you can hop over into our Discord server, discord.gg slash Monterey Bay Aquarium, and join us uh, for our awesome conversations that we're having over there. Uh, we have an entire Into the Deep channel with a whole bunch of questions uh, that we were able to, to pull from for Mac and George today. You can throw those questions in there as well, and we'll try and answer them as we can. That's right. George McKenzie, thank you again. Oh, thank you. This is a great opportunity to share our knowledge. Exactly. Thank you. It's a blast. And hopefully we'll have some more ocean explorers out there. That's right. And yes. you'll get to uh, take that first step into your exploration of the deep sea without necessarily having to jump over uh, off of a volcano in the middle of the ocean, 5,000 feet deep, just behind Mackenzie there, that new Into the Deep special exhibition or just exhibition will be there uh, for many years forward to be able to meet all of those deep sea animals um, that we're that this incredible team is working on to be able to share with, with all of you. Into the Deep opens April 9th. If you're a member of the aquarium, you have preview days starting April 2nd. Uh, make sure that you are subscribed to all the various social media channels that you might be following Mbari or the aquarium on to find out new updates and to stay connected with that, uh, that ocean that is right there in your backyard out there in the deep and sometimes migrating up at night to be seen during a black water dive. With that, everybody, thank you so much. And we hope to deep see you all again soon here on the Aquarium's channels and on Embari's as well. Thanks, everyone.